Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being in person and on the uh, virtual for the Grand Rounds this morning. I want to thank, first of all, United Therapeutics and Pfizer, uh, both for their kind support this early Monday morning. And uh, I want to um, take the opportunity to introduce my friend, Nada Skake. This is a special Grand Rounds this morning, and Dr. Skake is going to share with us some of his experiences in working in uh, in war ravaged areas and delivering health care, especially appropriate with what's going on in the world right now. And it's uh, great to have you give this uh, personal experience. So I'll welcome you up, Nada, and we'll be sure. anxious to hear what you have to share. OK, thank you so much. I think I got my own. Uh... All right, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Let me shut my phone off here. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharkey. It's always a pleasure working with you and with your fantastic team. Uh, thanks for uh, coming up on this uh, Monday morning, first day of the spring. Yay! <laughs> no snow almost than uh, where my house is, so it's kind of amazing to look outside. I don't see uh, uh, mountains of snow. Um, I, th I thought about a topic to talk about. We always talk about health stuff and medical research stuff, and I think, you know, it's very important to show a different perspective of, of healthcare, especially these days, what's, you know, especially with what's going on in Ukraine and so forth. So I think it's important to open opportunities for people like yourself who is interested to deliver optimal health care for people in need. Before we do this, I'm just going to remind you that I am a PI of a trial called the STRI trial, looking into semaglutide um, in patients with a mild perforate ear disease, trying to look at semaglutide, which is a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist that's been proven to reduce cardiovascular risk in patients with uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and increased cardiovascular risk. Now, this trial is going to look into um, the maximum walking distance in patients with mild peripheral ear disease, um, as well as diabetes mellitus, to see if the maximum walking distance will improve with semaglutide 0.25 milligram um, uh, sub-Q for four weeks and then followed by 0.5 milligram and follow up patients as, uh, as we move forward. So if you have patients with peripheral ear disease in your cardiology clinic, as long as uh, they are diabetic, please refer them to myself or Andrea. She's sitting back there. Thank you so much. Um, I think without any further ado, I'd like to go back to my slide deck. All right. Okay. So let's take it off here. Um, a few disclosure. I think the only relevant thing is that I got a fund from Medtronic who provided us with some catheters when I traveled a couple of times. So for any successful medical mission, you have to think about few actually items to make sure that it is a successful medical mission. The location you're going to go to has to be accessible, safe, which is some, sometimes it's hard to kind of find 100% safe and 100% accessible location. And you have to think about accommodation for yourself and your staff. Patients, because there are a lot of patients around the globe that they are actually in need. So, but you have to be selective, those patients in most for your, for your services. In terms of logistics, you have to think about coordination uh, with local health teams on the ground. Uh, because you can't just show up on a location that nobody knows that you're coming because they have to be prepared. You have a very limited duration of time on the ground, so you have to really have that collaboration with local teams that know what's going on there. Um, maybe a sponsoring health uh, care uh, system or organization. It could be local from here, or it could be from uh, the sponsoring or the welcoming country. Equipment and supplies. If you're going to go to do a cardiology uh, procedure, you have to know that you know you have the, st the staff as well as the equipment that you're going to use, right? For myself, when I perform these vein procedures, I have to make sure that I have the needles, the syringes, the um, local I'm going to use, like the missing anesthesia, for instance. I have to make sure that I get the catheters I'm going to use to ablate the veins. Um, staff. Um, also, um, don't expect when you go on the third world country that the staff there, when you walk in in the OR or procedure room, that they're going to be trained to say, hey, I need uh, so, such and such. Oh, yeah, there it is, doc, like we already spoiled here. 
don't expect that to be uh, to be 100% meeting your uh, needs when you go there. Time and weather. So, for instance, if you go to, let's say, Ukraine as an example, if you're going to go to Ukraine, maybe in winter might be really kind of hard. But you have to think that it doesn't mean that you can go, but you have to take in consideration the weather. And the time off, when you have to take time off to make sure that you adjust for your travel time and so forth. And the fund, you know, um, are you going to pay for your trip, for your tickets? Remember that there are tickets involved, there are borders, crossing borders. I'm going to talk about this when I went to Palestine. Um, and also, uh, for, for the fund, as I said, it could be organizational. So uh, there is actually, as you know, volunteer match here in Alina that they, ca they used to fund medical missions. And since COVID, that's been stopped. And hopefully, that will resume sometime soon. And, and physician factors, um, experience, you know, it's practicing medicine or providing health uh, services outside the country, it is extremely different, okay? So because the situation I'm going to show you with pictures could be very different. And you have to be very unbiased. I think this is a very important point. You have to exempt yourself from religious thoughts and beliefs, political views, anything, like gender, sex, everything. Because when you go there, you don't have to have, think about anything else but providing health care to these patients in need. So thinking about all these factors, given where I was born, I thought about the people in need might be people of uh, Palestine or the Palestinian territories, if you will. I think it is important to think about the map here. I'm not sure if there is a pointer here that I can show, but uh, there's the arrow, but you know, that's fine. So um, Palestine or Israel, if you, whatever you want to call it, it's a very small, it's actually 27,000 kilometers square of a small country. Uh, in the east is Jordan, Mediterranean in the west, and Egypt in the southwest, and Lebanon and Galali High to Syria, and the north uh, territories there. Why I brought this map up for Palestinians to cross to Gaza Strip. This is where Gaza Strip is right here. It's a very small uh, piece of land right here. To access to Gaza Strip, there are two only two ways. One is Rafah border with Egypt right here. And the other one is actually uh, through Ares checkpoints, which is north of Gaza, that it's the connection between Israel and Gaza Strip. And for Palestinians, as I mentioned, to cross the Gaza Strip, you have to come either from Jordan and you would be deported because you cannot access anywhere in Israel or Palestinian territories. You have to be deported from uh, Jordan borders all the way down to Ares and then go to Gaza. And that's very selective. Most of the time, you don't even have that access. Most of the time, for people from uh, Palestine, especially Gaza, they have to cross through Egypt, which is very difficult to do that as well. Um, just as a little history, um, so before 1947, this whole piece of land used to be called Palestine. And between 1947 war and 1967, the land being contracting to the expense of the Palestinian population to the Israeli population. And now there's Gaza Strip right here, which is controlled by Hamas. And then the West Bank, which is controlled by Fatah, which is uh, uh, President Mahmoud Abbas uh, territories. And it's kind of, uh, it's kind of lost very small pieces of lands because of the settlements uh, around these areas here. Um, Palestinian population, it's very hard to come down to a really exact number of the Palest Palestinian population. But uh, based on a, uh, a demographic analysis in 2020, it was about 13.5 million, uh, out of which about 5.2 million in the Palestinian territories distributed between the West Bank, 3.1 million, and uh, 2.2 million in Gaza Strip. As you're going to see that Gaza Strip is the most condensed area uh, for population pay, pay, uh, uh, per uh, meter square. And most of these populations are refugees. Thinking about Ukrainian now, if you want to tie this with the Palestinians, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Palestinians have been refugees since uh, 1947, 48. And there's also the lands of the uh, 1948 occupied lands. There, there is uh, 1.8 million uh, Palestinians. And there are the refugees outside Palestinian territories distributed in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. Even in the USA, there is about 255,000 uh, Palestinian Americans in the United States. Now, why Gaza Strip? As I said, Gaza Strip is a very small piece of land. Um, and as I said, to go to Gaza, you have only two ways to do that, either through Rafah borders on the south with Egypt, 
or with Israel. It's the Erez checkpoint in the north. Um, uh, it's a very small, it's 378 kilometers. It's very, really small. So if you go from north Gaza to the south of Gaza, it's about uh, 50 miles or even less than 40 miles or so. From east, from west, from the sea to the eastern border of Gaza, you can cross that in less than 45 minutes. It's pretty small. Um, tight closure since 2006. Um, five major ma military camp campaign. Uh, the last one, everybody remembers, in May of last year, 2021, uh, was a devastating uh, campaign that occurred there. Um, how are the situations there? And again, why I chose to go to Gaza? Because of many, many reasons, including the situations uh, on the ground. Electrical power is out for 20 hours a day. You only get power four hours a day. Imagine that the hospital runs with no power for 20 hours a day, right? Uh, food insecurity, up to 60% of the time. Municipal water, it's kind of, you know, 90% of the time is not drinkable. Unemployment, resources are almost kind of exhausted. Think about industry, agriculture, financial situations. They are all about to collapse. Um, if you look at the population density per kilometer square, it is the highest in the world. Actually, I, I visited refugee camps. Like a room like this, it will host like about 50 people that actually sometimes when they sleep, they have to take kind of uh, times, different times to be able to fit in that room to be able to sleep. Unemployment, as I mentioned, is pretty significant. Poverty up to 85% of the time. Though literacy, it's very, it's very high, you know, 96%. In 1967, the Palestinians were actually the highest education population in the world. Um, this is kind of a, a picture of one of the refugee camps. It's, it's kind of very condensed. And as I said, the refugee problem in the Palestine, with the Palestinian population started in 1948 up to these days. And um, millions of, of Palestinians live in these kind of condensed refugee camps. And when I visited one of the refugee camps there, sometimes when you walk in the small roads between the houses to deliver care, literally, this is a good size of uh, one kind of pass between the passage between the houses. Sometimes you have to walk like this way to be able to fit into, into these uh, smaller roads between the uh, houses. This is a picture of Palestinian children in Gaza re, uh, trying to perform their homework because of no power to use candlelight. And I can't tell you how many people, how many children were actually lost their lives to fires because of these candlelights. And as I mentioned, poverty is a problem. And sometimes children who lost their parents in the war, they're trying to find their daily uh, food supplies from uh, sad resources. Uh, youth lost lots of future hope. This picture was taken in Shajaiya refugee camp, which was devastated in the war of July 2014. Um, so now let's focus on health system under closure. Um, because of the electrical crisis, you know, the health system is about to collapse. Hospital you know, it could be under darkness anytime. You, can, you know, I'll show you some pictures actually when I was there. Um, of course, you know, uh, power is gone 20 hours a day. You have to, to rely on fuels or oil to kind of fire up the generators. And you're gonna need 500,000 liters of fuel um, to kind of run these generators. And unfortunately, sometimes these fuel resources, they cannot pass through gas because there's a closure. Nothing comes in and out. It's, it's a very hard process to do that. Um, and without power, it's hard to storage blood. It's hard to kind of run dialysis unit. It's hard to run an OR because you need power for everything. Um, not only that, and health system was under attack. Unfortunately, so this is an ambulance that was attacked in the war of July 2014 that two MS and, and the patient lost their lives in that attack. And this, is, this attack too was one of uh, houses of my friends there. He's a physician. He used to lead the internal medicine department at Shifa Hospital in Gaza. Uh, this is his house. He lost his life along with 13 of his family members. And that's his picture, Dr. Ayman Abu Alof. So um, medical supply shortages, um, at least 200 babies uh, in the ICU is waiting fatal outcome. Many dialysis and ventilators patient lives in jeopardy. As I said, OR, uh, ORs need really uh, electrical power to uh, to run, and there is also medical medication shortage. In, in 2017, 43 percent of total essential and 48 percent of ICU and ED drugs were in shortage. This picture is from Shifa Hospital, showing a uh, the main um, medication um, 
uh, storage of pharmacies, actually you can see the shelves almost uh, all kind of empty for essential drugs. We're not talking about chemotherapy or fancy drugs like semaglutide, for instance. Um, operation rooms, this patient was about to go into for an acute abdomen and the power went off, so he's waiting for generators to kick in so he can go to the operation room. Imagine that you're about to start a cath uh, on a patient with acute coronary syndrome and you get the power, just goes off. And there's also uh, Gaza Strip, there, this healthcare there is limited, right? So a lot of patients, they would love to leave Gaza Strip to, to access healthcare in Israel. Israel is one of the best, actually, healthcare systems in the world. They provide fantastic healthcare uh, to their patients and patients from abroad. But the access to the Palestinians is very, 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 very limited. Uh, for instance, 45% of the urgent health-related travel permits were denied by the Israeli authorities. And unfortunately, even the Palestinian Authority have to be fair. They also did not mitigate to help to facilitate these permissions for people from Gaza to leave to, to Israel or even to the West Bank because of the conflict even between the West, West Bank and Gaza governments, which is, which is stupid. It's very sad. Um, several hospitals actually shut down due to limited resources. As you know, United Nations, uh, they donate about 374 millions or 500 millions a year, and there is actually a shortage now. Uh, if you remember, President uh, Trump uh, previously cut the aid uh, for the uh, United Nations Relief Foundation to, to the Palestine, and President uh, Biden resumed that on a limited uh, basis at this time. Now, um, this picture is in, uh, for four newborns uh, in Gaza, in Shifa Hospital. Shifa Hospital is the main hospital in Gaza. Um, you know, you're supposed to have one incubator per, per child, but you get four sharing the same uh, in, incubator. Um, trauma could be the most common reason for death in, in Gaza due to the wars there. Now, let's kind of focus on the medical missions. For all of these reasons, Gaza Strip would be a really great place uh, if you know you're in and out uh, there to provide health care to, to these people in need. Uh, Palestinian Children Relief Fund is, a, is an organization that actually in Ohio started by Steve Sasabi, is an American citizen gentleman that was married with a uh, woman from, from West Bank who got cancer, his wife, and died of cancer, so he had devoted all his life to try to help people in, uh, in, in uh, Palestine with medical missions from different part, portions of the, uh, countries of the world to, to uh, not just to Palestine, but also to the uh, Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern countries. Um, thousands of, of, of physicians actually went there to, to Palestine to help uh, patients in need in the Middle East as well, too. Uh, they were actually the contact for myself to get down there. This is their actually headquarter building in Gaza. It was destroyed in May of 2021. Uh, war as well too. You can see that the unfortunately when you have a conflict that these airstrikes like what's happening in Ukraine now hospitals and schools and stuff gets really striked for unknown reason. So this is this is a picture of Rafah border. Um, unfortunately this crossing between Egypt and, and Gaza Strip most of the year is closed. When it's open there is at one point there were about 50,000 Palestinians trying to leave Gaza Strip for urgent needs. And you only get 200 people to cross a day if the crossing border is open. So very limited access uh, to these people to leave and in and out. This, this young girl had a significant fracture of her right lower extremity during the war and trying to leave for operation to fix her uh, fracture. And she was waiting on the borders for weeks um, to be able to leave. And this is the Limbe Bridge. This is actually the crossing borders between Jordan and Israel. Um, so, uh, um, so if you want to go for, for myself, example, I was born in Gaza, so I have a dual citizenship. I'm a Palestinian American. I have American passport. I would not be able to cross there. If I want to go through uh, Israel, I have to apply for a special permit. It takes months. Most of the time I get denied, but sometimes if, it's, if, it's, if I get access, I have to be deported from there all the way down to areas. I can't access, uh, even the West Bank, I can't access there. Even my children who were born in America here in the United States, they have nothing to do with back there. They can't have access because of their parents, where they were from. 
So you cross borders and you go all the way down to a raised crossing points, which is the most secure um, uh, borders in, on Earth. Um, and then, so this picture is in, in Gaza. This is the headquarter uh, uh, quarter building of, of Shifa Hospital. This ambulance was donated by Qatar. Uh, Qatar actually provided a lot of donation for healthcare system in, in Gaza Strip. So this picture is with the uh, vascular surgery team in, in Gaza. Uh, so this uh, Dr. Ismail Jedba is the uh, head for vascular surgery. They do very limited surgeries. They don't have really catheters. They don't, even ABI, is sometimes hard to find these kind of cuff, blood pressure cuffs and stuff. So they perform surgeries. Imagine a vascular surgeon in a war zone. You, can't, you have those kind of uh, cases with, you know, ruptured, you know, arteries or, you know, significant limb traumas, and you have to operate on these patients under these circumstances. Go figure, right? It's very, very hard. Um, this is actually a uh, couple of nursing staff. Uh, the gentleman in the middle is the uh, staff nurse, the head staff nurse in, at the Shifa Hospital. He was telling me there when I was working with him, he had not had his wage or salary for the past six months prior. And the reason is because of limited uh, 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 money resources for the health system because of the siege. When you have a siege, Gaza under siege since 2006, even money transfers are real limited as well. So I said, why do you then, how do you manage? Why, I mean, how, why, why are you at work if you, can, if you don't get paid? He said, who's gonna take care of these cases if I don't show up uh, to work? Um, <laughs> this is our uh, waiting area where we had a designated a waiting area in the hospital because the hospital is full with other emergent cases. So we, I was given just this area for the patients to wait and imagine that this, this is 2015. You could see the dates actually at the bottom. Um, this is a beautiful young uh, female who was around three years of age when I saw her. She has Sturge Weber syndrome, which is a, which pa pa patients, as you know, can have AV malformation. She had a vascular tumor in her brain, and, and she was denied access to go to Israel for treatment. Um, and I don't know what happened to her because when I left in 2015, Friday, when I went back for other medical mission trying to find out what happened to her, I couldn't, I couldn't get the information. Very sad. Uh, this gentleman that I saw there, he has klippel turnani syndrome, which is a very rare uh, vascular disease. Patients will come with hemihypertrophy. It happened in his right arm. See how the right arm is bigger than the left. And they usually have significant venous malformations, like you see in the gentleman. You see this, these large varicosities in the right upper extremity. Uh, so the treatment could be very difficult. At that time, in the summer of 2015, I did not have catheters with me. I only had a uh, sotradicol uh, uh, sclerosing agent. And I was able to treat that gentleman. I'll show his picture um, uh, with ultrasound got a sclerotherapy. So now every picture has a story. Um, so this story behind this picture that I'm putting up here, this is the nurse that, the local nurse that uh, worked with me when I was there. And I, her and I were sharing a stretcher or a table. You're going to say, why both of you share one table, you know, sitting on the table rather than the patient being on the table? Well, because the room is very small and you don't even have a chair for a physician or a nurse to sit down on, and look at the uh, patient chart and stuff. So you have to share that table with the nurse and with the patient. Now I'm sitting, what the heck, right? The physician is sitting and the patient is standing because I sat, I, sta I stood most of the day that, that time. It was summer. Uh, Gaza is very hot, not as hot as Dubai or, or the Gulf area, but it is, it's humid enough that you would be just melting, really, you know, during the day with no AC. You think that the hospital has AC? Of course not. So you have to really, um, you know, you have to think about that. So I, I sat that minute and they took the picture and I felt so sad. I said, well, people are going to think crazy. Doc, you know, he's sitting and the patient is standing. Uh, now me and the patient uh, are <laughs> sitting, sharing the location. I'm trying to feel the pulse. This patient had a critical limp ischemia and they couldn't, they couldn't really bypass his, his, his there's no really uh, easy uh, resolution for his or, or solution for his uh, critical limp ischemia. This is the procedure room that I was given. The reason for that picture, uh, for this picture, is a couple of things. The procedure room door is broken. You can notice that, right? And they couldn't be, they couldn't, it couldn't be fixed. And this is the next patient waiting online. Go figure HIPAA, right? Uh, this patient is kind of waiting online to kind of get, because they are anxious. So before Dr. Skake leave, we have to get in line to get the procedure done. 
So I'm performing an ultrasound, God is clear on this patient. Uh, uh, this gentleman is uh, um, one of the vascular surgeons, one of the nurses that I work with. This is the summer of 2015 still. Uh, this is the gentleman with Klippel Ternani syndrome, so I'm kind of using that ultrasound to try to find where these varicosities are coming, what is the feeding vein, and trying to hit it with the uh, sclerosing, scler sclerosing agent there. Oh, by the way, this, uh, this is Miss Abid. She's the social worker from the PCRF uh, foundation that I go through to, to go to Gaza. So she actually helps uh, to put the patient uh, schedule for myself and try to find who are the best appropriate patients for the medical mission, not just for my mission, but also for other medical missions as well, too. Reason for this picture while I was uh, performing ultrasound goddess sclerotherapy is the ultrasound machine. This probably is the 1970 of a machine, so you barely can see the vein. You know, it's it's you know sometimes these veins could be a millimeter, a couple of millimeters. You have to go to access, and think about you know this quality of image that you have to rely on, and so um, so it was very hard to kind of perform these procedures uh, under these uh, circumstances. Now, why I am showing why am I showing this picture? Uh, the um, sanitation and uh, cleaning staff went on strike when I was there. So when you go for medical mission, you have to think about also cleaning after you perform procedure because it could be that the staff went on strike that day and we actually spend almost half an hour cleaning uh, behind because I don't want to leave my mess for somebody else to clean up if there is no anybody else to do that after your procedure. This is Dr. Sobi. He's actually the head uh, physician for Shifa Hospital, providing a certificate. Um, now, this is the summer of 2018. Um, so I was able to get a few kits of Venaseal, which is one of the most advanced techniques to, for vein closure procedure. I think Dr. Stephenson mentioned that last, uh, yeah, last Monday. So actually, this device is used to glue up the incompetent truncal veins, which is, as I said, one of the most advanced techniques, which is actually recently just made it to Israel. Um, so I was able to get about 20, 30 kits down to Gaza. Imagine, look at the kit here. Um, it looks like what? Looks like a gun. We call it a gun to deliver that glue. So imagine me and my family. This is, by the way, my wife, who is a trained nurse. Uh, she's an artist now, but she wears her, her uh, nurse hat when it comes to Palestine. So we have to carry these kits with us to, from United States to Gaza Strip. So I traveled to Turkey first to find out if I'm going to go through Egypt or from Jordan based on the permit situation. And you have to carry these through the airport. So you had to stop, of course, here in Minneapolis, MSP. They said, well, oh, you're carrying guns? What the heck? Because when you put school on the Austin stand, they look, oh, my gosh, what the heck are you carrying? So I have to show these letters and stuff, these sentences. And in Turkey, the same story. I found like these guys, security guards, came running after me. Stop, stop, you got guns. I said, no, I don't have guns. They are guns, but they are medical guns. Um, and then through Egypt and Jordan, even the Jordanians had to stop us. They asked us to pay 6,000 um, Jordanian dinars, which about $8,000 for customs, for these devices. He said, well, listen, this is, I'm going to donate my time, and these are fund. So I can't give you this. They have no knowledge. They have to just get the money. So if it, the, the problem is the corrupted systems that you face when you go down there. There, are, there is no logic. So I have to explain many, many, many times, and I had to pay just $1,000, which I had to pay out of my pocket to get these down there. By the way, when I go for medical mission, I don't accept any... Um, money from even PCRF because I go to, there are people that are in need, so I don't, it's kind of conflict of interest to do that, at least for myself, because I was born there. Um, so that's the story behind that uh, gun there. So this, the patient that I was treating is, it was a teacher who had significant stasis changes, including ulcers, that nobody could provide the care for, and unfortunately I was able to, uh, uh, you know, help her with her, um, uh, with her procedure. Uh, the reason for this picture also, there are two medical students. There are actually two main medical schools in Gaza, Al-Azhar University and Islamic University Medical Schools. Uh, these two, um, uh, uh, this gentleman and this young lady, they are medical students and they are four, four years of it, four, uh, fourth year medical uh, students. And this, this gentleman is the Abu Bakr Dawood. He's the, doc, the chief 
of the uh, vascular surgery uh, in Shifa Hospital at that time. Um, that's again another procedure, another uh, uh, picture showing accessing that vein uh, down there. Uh, that's my wife and my son. You're gonna say, your son is young, what's young? What the heck he's doing in the war, right? You know, and he said, he told me, Dad, I'm coming anyways, I'd like to help. I said, you can't, you're still young, you're still minor, you can't be in the medical, uh, you know, uh, ward or even in the ICU or anywhere, we, you can't. He said, no, find something that I could do. So what I told him is, he can actually draw the medication and just uh, put those top cocks together. Uh, because for ultrasound guided sclerotherapy, it's not sterile procedure, it's a clean procedure. So he is kind of, he was very happy. He said, Dad, I feel great that I tried to help somehow. And that's my wife there. Um, and then, so um, this is actually the mission in 2019. You can see the uh, year is actually down on the bottom. Uh, this is an Indonesian hospital. The whole hospital was donated by the by Indonesian government. Um, so that was, uh, uh, the medical mission was actually performed in, in, the, in that hospital in 2019. Uh, the, the team there was actually new vascular surgeons that are uh, trying to learn uh, the technique. And uh, that's the same story there. And the nurses did a great job. The reason for this picture, as I said, every picture has um, a, a story. Not only that my son is standing back there, but, but also uh, look at the ultrasound uh, probe down here. Usually you know that we have to have the glove, the sterile glove for the ultrasound probe. And of course, when you ask, oh, I need a, a sterile glove for my ultrasound machine. What you mean? What do you mean by sterile glove? You don't have that. So you have to invent. So we have those sterile wraps that I have to wrap the, the um, ultrasound probe to be able to perform uh, the procedure there. Uh, this picture actually for a patient that I performed staph lobectomy and, and thrombectomy at the same time, he came down with acute uh, thrombophlebitis of the right GSV, and he had actually significant varicosities out of that GSV and had stasis, stasis changes. Um, and I took him to, to the OR that same day. Um, I closed the remnant GSV as well as I, just, uh, I performed staph lobectomy. I took all of these varicosities out, and I took this bunch of clot out. And he, oh my gosh, when you see this, the happiness on these patients' faces, it pays off. It's different when you perform a medical care or a procedure for charity, right? For patients to be, to please patients than to do it for money, absolutely different. So um, it's very, very gratifi 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 gratifying. Uh, this picture belongs to a 13 year old female who presented with, uh, since birth, with uh, venous malformation in the right medial, uh, right lateral malleolus actually, and and the left um, anterior uh, shin as well. I performed ultrasound guided sclerotherapy uh, under, um, ultra, uh, under ultrasound and guidance with citradecol, and that helped quite a bit. Unfortunately, I looked for the picture when I went next year, that was 2019, and I couldn't find it, but she felt she, you know, her uh, malformation completely resolved and she was very happy. This picture in 2019 in the summer with the chief of the vascular surgeon uh, there who really kind of, I tried to kind of train them to try to, for them to kind of perform these procedures when I, when I left. So this picture, uh, this video clip I'm gonna actually play right now, um, prepared by the PCRF. This actually was just last summer. So let's see if I can uh, play this right here. for the vascular lab. I'm the, I have the great pleasure being in uh, Gaza Strip uh, for about two weeks with some venous seal kits and, uh, and surgical sclerotherapy agent. I'm here to treat uh, uh, patients and try to help patients with venous, with venous insufficiency. I'd like to thank uh, Mishwanik for providing a fund for uh, venous seal kits. And I'd like to thank uh, PCRF for helping uh, my mission and facilitating the process of seeing patients and performing the procedure. All right, so this is from, oops. Okay, so this picture belongs to a patient, as you could tell, uh, with venous stasis ulcer. 
who he, actually he had this also for two years prior to my uh, most recent medical mission. So he has underlying significant venous insufficiency. So I performed ultrasound guided sclerotherapy uh, for the remnant because the GSV half of it was thrombosed. And this is before and this is after, just a couple of months after. And I communicated with him recently, he's almost healed. So that was very rewarding as well, too, to see. Um, why this picture? And again, this is the summer of 2021. That was uh, the time when we had COVID. Um, you could tell this, this room here is not a procedure room. And you could tell the door, oops. Um, trying to go back. The door is actually blocked with sheets because this was a waiting area in the hospital. So we were actually given a waiting area, have to invent, think out of the box to transform the waiting area into a procedure room, right? And so you have to put shades, uh, you know, using blankets to block the uh, vision from outside. Um, and then this picture, you could see that I'm using my iPad. So the ultrasound problem, I got solved in the next year with the medical mission. So I, I got a uh, portable ultrasound probe and you can connect it to your own computer or your own iPad. You can even see those uh, pictures of, of views on your smartphone as well. So see the picture, how clear it is. This is, uh, I was performing an, a, 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 a venous on a patient. So this, this is showing the greater softness vein down there. So that was a blessing to see this. These are new, uh, uh, the actual trainees for vascular surgery down there in the same procedure rooms. They are trying to watch and learn how to do that. Um, I, you know, this is a video clip. I want you to see what's happened there. Um, so I was performing a procedure on a patient and suddenly the power goes off and see what happened uh, when that happened. Because you know, you have to have some light source to see what the heck is going on. Look at the patient. The patient is using his cell phone for a light, for the spotlight. And I was, I, I said, well, I'm so sorry. And the, and the trainees are also using their <laughs> phones to kind of shed the light on the leg. And I felt so sad. I told the patient, I'm so sorry that you had to do this. You know, no, 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 this happens every day. I mean, why are you sorry? This is normal. You know, so, um, so when I go there, I try to do whatever I could help, right? So they said, well, can you come and talk about venous disease to the medical students? And I went there and I, this is kind of the uh, lecture, the people, that, the medical students, they are fourth year medical students that they gathered to listen to a venous uh, talk. Uh, this is in Alizar University. And the, uh, uh, this is actually the medical dean in the middle and his, his uh, helper. And um, um, I think he's a professor in physics. He introduced me to the, to the teams as well too. Now, let's put the medical stuff behind and let's kind of look at Gaza a little bit. It's a beautiful, beautiful little city on the Mediterranean. It's only 60 kilometers from Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is north of Gaza. And it's only uh, 15 miles from Ashkelon, uh, which is also a very nice little town in, in Israel. If somebody, I'm sure if some of you visited Israel before. Beautiful, beautiful pieces of lands. This is the city of Gaza. This is the Mediterranean. Gaza is not like, you know, very small, I mean, it's a very small place, but it's not like a retarded place. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful place. Uh, nice high-rise, high-rising building. This is called Al, uh, Omar al-Mukhtar Street. This is the main street in Gaza. In Gaza. This is the port down here. Um, uh, fishermen, by the way, fishermen are not always allowed to go and fish. When they are allowed to fish, they only can go six miles inside, otherwise they get shot at by the Israeli uh, military forces. Uh, this is Gaza port. Um, um, it's beautiful. Uh, this building where I got married, um, this is where the wedding took place. Um, and these are the cabins of Gaza. Look at the cabins of the Mediterranean. Uh, small but beautiful. Um, this is actually a sunset in the, on the sea there. Uh, this is the neighborhood where I was born. It's called Rimal region or Rimal neighborhood. It's one of the most... Uh, a kind of advanced place, uh, areas in Gaza or luxury places in Gaza. Um, and this is, this, is, this is our house. This is where I was born, actually, in this house. This is our neighborhood. These are our neighbors there. Um, why this picture? Well, not only it looks nice, but also this is my medical sc middle school, not medical school. Uh, middle school, and this is where I did my elementary school. Uh, as you can see, the color is blue and white. This is the uh, United Nations Relief Organization, UNRWA. Uh, this, these are schools are all run and supported by the refugee 
um, uh, uh, Department of the United Nations. Um, this is Shajaya refugee camp. This tree is very famous there. I don't know even how to say it in English. It's called Jumez. There is nothing such a tree in the United States or even outside the Gaza Strip. It's a very unique tree in Gaza. It's more than 100 years of age. Um, this is the Faraz Bazaar where people go and buy their veggies and fruits. Uh, you could see the reason for the picture that they use horse carts because the gas is limited. There is no always you know, fuels and stuff that goes in and out of Gaza. Um, this is again on the same Firas Bazaar. Gaza is very famous for spices and peppers. By the way, we use pepper more than Indians and Pakistanis or Chinese do, especially in Gaza. The pepper, actually, when you smell the pepper, your eyes will, will kind of tear. Forget about tasting it. If you want to try, you can come to my house and can cook you something, and then just you have to be prepared. Um, spices, as I said, are very famous. This, so you have different pickles. Uh, this is the pepper that I talked about, pickle. Uh, Pickle, pickle. This is Times Square in Gaza. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Looks like it. Um, this is Fehmi Bake uh, Square. Um, it's actually a famous square in Gaza. In 2015, from the day, from the times that I was able to, this is one of the only times that I was able to cross to, to Jerusalem. As I said, although I'm an American citizen, I'm not allowed to cross anywhere in, in Israel or Palestinian territories. So I was lucky enough to go in and visit the old city. It's beautiful. I'm sure you guys have been, some of you can go and visit. So I would recommend that uh, you do that. At the end, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you for allowing me to share these slides. I think it's different to kind of perform medical mission in a different environment. Because as I said, um, it's very, very different in a sense when you ask for basic instrument or basic, you know, um, materials when you're there, you said, oh, you, you'll be told that, oh, no, we don't have that. Like, for instance, when I went for the first medical mission, I'm asking for size 8 gloves. What? You know, you have to thank God if you even find you some gloves here. So I had to deal with, you know, size 7, and I had to really kind of use my hands to, in a different way, to be able to perform procedure. So I think it's different perspective, and it helps to enrich your Vision, when you come back here, you see how much spoiled we are. When I come back from medical mission, I go to the OR and feel very happy. And hey, I'd like to, you know, a mosquito. Oh, there you go, doc. Yeah, I need to exist this. And I feel, oh my gosh, I didn't see that just a week ago. So I think it's great. And you also help uh, people in need uh, see what's going on in Ukraine. I think that's a good timing for this presentation because there are millions that flee their homes in Ukraine which happened in Syria. There are millions of Syrian people, Syrian refugees, fled their houses in the past few years. Millions of Palestinians, as I said, 6.5 million refugee Palestinians had fled their houses 74 years ago. Where is the attention? It's very sad that there is double standard out there, but that's not my topic. My topic is, I think, it's good to think perspective for us because we are one of the best centers in the world to go to take our experience to people who are in need without, again, without any bias uh, in this picture. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Volunteer Match uh, Section in Alina, who actually provided some fund in the past, uh, PCRF, Palestinian Children Relief Fund, Medtronic, and my family, my wife, has actually devoted a lot of time uh, for uh, providing uh, medical care. I'd like to stop here. I know it's a different topic, and we're not talking about research trials and stuff, but I think it's good to kind of see how MHI went across the uh, borders to provide ultimate care outside in very uh, hard situations, under hard situ uh, situations. Thank you so much for coming today. Yes, John. That's one of the best talks that I've heard. Oh, thank you. So thank you. <laughs> now, your main skill is in medicine. Right. In Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you obviously do as well, mm -hmm. and that makes sense to just transport there and do that. Mm -hmm. How did you use your medical information? Is there a way to make that an ongoing process? Yeah, so um, I'm kind of internist by training, but as, as you know, I do some procedures as well, too. The, the difficulty is not to use your own knowledge, because you can teach, you can tell using your abilities to kind of transmit the knowledge that you have to the physicians. But the difficulties that we face is how to transport this, the equipment that you need to use. Uh, the first mission in 2010-11, mm -hmm. 
I was a trainee at Mayo, and we had to go with a spine surgeon who had a $3 million equipment because they do a lot of these dissections for the spine and stuff. And he had to be held in Egypt because they said, no, 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 this equipment, we would not let you go with your equipment. Which is sad, how he's going to perform these procedures? And he had to, actually two weeks waiting in Egypt, he had to stay behind to get his equipment to kind of be released. And unfortunately, he couldn't get that released. He had to, he had to use older equipment in Gaza to do that. So transmitting the medical knowledge or sharing the medical knowledge is not a problem because you can meet with physicians there that you can share your own experience. You can, you'll give, you'll be given a podium and uh, venues to, to present like I was in uh, medical school, like I did in the medical school. Um, you can also do virtual uh, presentations. I still do actually virtual presentations to, to the medical students sometimes in my own time, you know, weekend and so. So the problem is actually the staff who is going to be able to perform a cat, you know, catheter-based angiogram for, for you guys, for a cardiologist, and the equipment that you're going to, you so that's where the problem is yeah yes scott i'll echo what john said about the presentation oh, thank you. mesmerizing and uh one thing you kind of alluded to was um documentation and follow-up i mean oh yeah that's i didn't talk to, about this. Uh, give us a little bit of perspective on yeah that. because you go there and you perform procedure right so you have to have a consent i didn't actually i should I should put that on the next time if I present there somewhere else. Uh, because you expect it to have a consent. Before I go there, let's do it, let's put it this way. I have to communicate with the World Health Organization office in Gaza, the PCRF from here. I get letters to say, hey, Dr. X and Y and the staff are going from, let's say, June 10th to June 25th. They're going to be performing such procedures in this hospital. So there will be a, 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 a letter in English as well as in Arabic. And they will list the uh, equipment that I will be carrying with me. So they will, so the people on the borders, they will actually, okay, so Skeik is coming to do this and these are the equipment and because they question everything. So that's the first thing. The, the, uh, also the World Health Organization, WHO office in Gaza, communicates with the Ministry of Health in Gaza. And they communicate with the medical staff in the hospital that we're going to perform the medical mission. So they will, you will have a letter uh, to kind of, talk, you know, confirming that you'll be performing a medical mission within these days. And when you get there, the social worker that I showed you a picture of, uh, she prepares a list of patients and she will consent them, right, for procedures and for medical care. And when I go there, of course, before each procedure, like I do here, I explain what I'm going to do, right? And I'm gonna, I talk about risk and benefits. And the staff in Gaza, when I leave, they keep records of these patients and they follow these patients off. And I, I have been communicating with them via WhatsApp and you know, social media to ensure that there are no complications. Luckily, so far, I didn't encounter any significant complications. On the contrary, I see those results of stasis also is being healed. Um, I, see I see actually, uh, uh, patients with malformations, they started to heal. Uh, medical students are actually now communicating with them. We just, uh, we just actually um, submitted a major review paper on SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists in patients with peripheral arterial disease with the help of medical student in Gaza. So she, she was an author on that paper. So you feel really kind of rewarded to, to see this. So. So if you guys are interested, I'm, I know that teams go from, I mean, so I'm not the only one who has been performing these medical missions, but performing these medical missions in Gaza, it has a different taste and a different uh, uh, perspective. And I have to say, I'm not the only guy that goes to Gaza. There are, you, there are a lot of medical uh, uh, teams that come from the United States, you know, from Mayo Clinic, from Cleveland, and from France, also from Europe, that go down to Gaza Strip. Recently, just two days ago, there was a pediatric surgeon from Michigan just made it to Gaza Strip to perform these, uh, these procedures and sur surgeries. But you can do it anywhere. As I said, Ukraine needs a lot of help uh, these days. You could do it in South America. I know our teams here from Alina went a lot to, uh, to South America. I don't mean to hog the no. question, but I, <laughs> um, can you comment on the, how the COVID crisis um, oh, yeah. affected that because of the density of the population and the conditions, I can't imagine 
that um, very good question. Especially in the last summer, uh, we were there in June. Um, we saw about 90 patients and performed 35 procedures in eight days. So remember that picture? It was not a procedure room. It was a waiting area because the rest of the hospital was occupied with COVID cases. And unfortunately, because of the limitation of access to vaccinations, limitation of access to um, you know, uh, ma masks and uh, face shields, it's the infection and you know, contagious, con you know, infection rate was pretty high down there, unfortunately. So you have to be careful when you're there. And unfortunately, not a lot of people had access to masks to put on when you see them. So you have to really be very careful. So I, before I hit there, I actually had my booster vaccine even before I went there with my wife. Um, and then so the, the, um, the rooms where you perform the procedure, we have limitation, limited resources. The nurses, you know, the nurse that I worked with before along with my wife, she was also uh, in the ICU helping people with COVID. So you get really limited resources. We could have done much more if we did not have a uh, COVID crisis down in Gaza. Um, the next time I went there in September, I went twice last year and I was planning to perform. Uh, we had a list of play patients that actually were waiting to, uh, to get their procedures. Unfortunately, I couldn't do anything that uh, second time because the cases were really skyrocketing down there. So I, I didn't feel comfortable. One thing about the vaccination, unfortunately, uh, it took a while to get vaccinated. The first uh, lot of vaccination, the Pfizer vaccine, they were actually outdated. They, you know, unfortunately, they were, you know, they were let in uh, in Gaza, and they were outdated. So they, you know, the government is in Gaza said, "Why we we're humans? We're not, you know. So why would you let uh, outdated vaccines?" So it's very sad when you see how it is, and and, and it's very different perspective there. Yes. Family that lives there? Yeah, actually, I still have my mom still there, as a matter of fact. And uh, <laughs> that's another reason why I go there, I guess. Um, so she's still there, and uh, she was sick, actually, two summers ago. My dad, actually, I have to tell you, my dad passed away 2017 when the borders were closed and shut. He got, he got sick. He had a hip fracture. I tried to go in, I communicated with the Israeli government, with the Egyptians, with everywhere, and I couldn't get to see to say goodbye to my dad. And this is a story like many other millions of Palestinians have on a daily basis. Very sad, very unfortunate. Yes? Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry I wasn't here for the beginning. I see volunteer match Alina, and having done one outside of Alina, I can echo what you say about uh, you know, it's a frontier of medicine that we don't think is a frontier and, and we don't think about it that much. It, was that first bullet point? Is there resources from Alina to yes to, uh, or, or MHI to maybe that's better? Let's go. So we, what do we have for physicians who may be interested in what, what you're doing? Okay, so the question is what resources do we have at Alina? to kind of perform medical missions. They have volunteer match. Actually, you receive email from them on probably a monthly basis. You see volunteer match. Um, so they used to, so they help you in terms of, you know, you can log on your hours when you leave. Like, let's say you do like 20 hours or whatever, 30 hours. They actually can provide you with resources. They used to give a maximum $1,000 fund to help. So I used to use that $1,000 to buy sclerotherapy uh, solution. Uh, I'm not sure if they can help you where you're going. So they provide you um, with letters that you're leaving, with, you know, you're supported by Alina. And I have to thank Beth Kearns, who's probably listening to us, because she provided, and Jill Sandstrom, providing letters to say, hey, Dr. Skeek is a medical director or whatever, Methane Center is, you know, so he's in a good st status with us, and they provide the contact information if you're overseas and say, how do you prove that you're a physician? So MHI does provide help, you know, starting from your managers and your chairs. Uh, they've helped me quite a bit when I left. Um, volunteer match is another uh, resource. The pharmacy, actually, if you say that you're going overseas for medical mission, you can buy the medications uh, uh, with the expense, with exact expense. You have to don't have to pay extra. Like the sclerosing and a social protocol, I have to pay out of pocket or people funded that as well. Uh, I used also the volunteer match. They give you the medications at the expense um, price. So, so these are the resources, not all a lot. 
but the organization that helps a lot of medical missions to the Middle East, not just to Palestine, is the Palestinian Children Relief Fund, pcrf.net. They have donation website, and they, they're actually a legit organization here, and it's supported by Jimmy Carter, the ex-president. Um, so he have, he's done a lot of presentations for them as well, too, so. Yep. All right, well, great. I'm, I'm so happy that you guys like to present. It's a different perspective and different topic. Thank you so much.